Hello and welcome to this latest Lowy Institute Live event. This is part of what we are calling the Long Distance Lowy Institute, in which we communicate our content and analysis online while we are unable to do so in person. My name is Jonathan Pryke, Director of the Pacific Islands Program here at the Lowy Institute. A very warm welcome to everyone joining us from Australia, those dialing in overseas, and in particular, our friends from the Pacific. I would also like to welcome our Lowy Institute corporate members and supporters. Before we go any further, let me acknowledge the traditional custodians on whose land I sit, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. The Pacific region has been hit hard by the coronavirus. While 10 Pacific nations, through a lot of foresight and a little luck, have quickly walled themselves off from the world and stopped the virus from hitting their shores, no country has been able to avoid the economic devastation trailing in the pandemic's wake. The numbers are eye-watering. Fiji expects its economy to contract by 21.7% this year. Vanuatu expects to lose two in every five of its formal sector jobs. A region-wide economic contraction of more than 10% this year is on the cards. Governments across the Pacific are throwing every available resource towards keeping their economies on life support. Pacific nations are not alone in this fight. Donor organizations from across the world are doing what they can to help respond to this once in a century crisis. While donors quickly adapt to where and how they're sending their aid, the way in which aid is delivered must also quickly adjust to, shut to the shut borders. The distance in the Pacific have never felt longer than they do in 2020. To help unpack these dynamics, I am joined by a stellar panel of guests. Joining us from Suva, uh, Fiji, where they're today celebrating their 50th independence anniversary, we have Audrey Omua. Deputy Director General at the Pacific Community and a veteran diplomat and aid practitioner across the Pacific. Joining us from Sydney is Michelle Kerf, who has led the World Bank's work in Papua New Guinea and the Pacific for the better part of the last five years. And finally, from Canberra, we have Charlotte Blundell, Assistant Secretary for the Pacific Partnerships and Human Development Branch in the Department of Foreign Affairs, Affairs and Trades Office of the Pacific. Thank you to all our panelists. We are also using this event as an opportunity to launch the third iteration of our Pacific Aid Map, an analytical tool that collates and analyzes data on all aid projects in the Pacific. Before I hand over to my colleague, Alex Diant, project lead of the Aid Map here at the Institute, a bit of housekeeping. At the bottom of your screens, you will see a Q&A button where you can submit questions to the panelists. And thank you to the dozens who have already submitted questions with their registrations. We will put as many of your questions as possible to our panelists later in the discussion. Please include the name of your organization or any other affiliation when you send through your question. With that said, over to you, Alex. Well, thanks, Jenna. Look, let me show you, let me explain you how we built the aid map before I show you how it works. So the first thing we had to do was to collect uh, information on, uh, on aid project in the Pacific. As Jonathan mentioned, the purpose of this aid map is to look at all the aid flows that are, that are coming from the aid, uh, for, sorry, from the, from the international community to the Pacific. And so to do this, we had to engage directly with development partners, uh, but we also had to scrape down like every budget document from Pacific island countries, every press release, every social media post, just to be able to make sure that we found all the information we could on aid project in the Pacific. What we ended up with is a data set of more than 38,000 projects and activities uh, from the international community to the Pacific. Well, once we had this data set, we sent it to, um, to each Pacific island countries so for them to actually validate the information we had. And then we put everything on an interactive platform, which is the Pacific aid map. I'll show you how it works. So this is the landing page of the Pacific aid map. You land on the year 2018, which is the year for which we have the, the most comprehensive data. However, you still have data from 2010 to 2020. The outer ring is what we call the donor ring. And so it ranks donor by order or sheer magnitude. So you see that here in 2018, Australia was the biggest donor of the region, followed by the World Bank, New Zealand, China, and the rest. If you click on one uh, development partners, you see uh, on the left, the information uh, automatically updates. And you see that, for instance, here, China committed $288 million uh, to the Pacific that year in 2018 and only spent, well, and spent $241 million on 77 projects. Then you have on the left, you still have um, high level information. So the top five recipients, top five projects of China in that particular year, 
Uh, and the inner ring of the Pacific Island map are actually the Pacific Island countries themselves. So every time you hover over one of the Pacific Island countries, the information on the left automatically updates as well and gives you more high-level information on the aid in that particular country on that particular year. On the left, we have implemented a series of filters so that every user can create their own Pacific aid map. You can filter by donors, so we have a list of 64 donors this year. You can filter by uh, recipients, so Pacific Island countries. You can filter by sector, so we have 12 sectors uh, from uh, the OECD. Um, you can also filter by aid type, so um, you can look whether a project is a grant or a loan, or whether it is ODA aid or OOF, other official flows. Um, and you can also look uh, by project according to its completion status. Is it being on hold? Is it being implemented? Complete? Now, let's say that we're interested in having a look at all the health projects in Papua New Guinea. What we have to do is just click on Papua New Guinea. And then you see that automatically individual projects start to populate the map. We have approximately 1,500 1, different locations for projects uh, in, in the map. And the interest, if you're looking for a health project here, what you would do is that you just uh, select um, health uh, in the in the in the uh, sector. Uh, sorry, in the sector filter, and then all the health project will start to appear in the specific aid map. Every time you hover on one project, you see the name of the project that appears on the left, the location or where where it is being implemented. You also actually see how much money is being spent on the on this particular project. What it is, what is its uh, completion status? You see some description of the project. Um, who's the donor? Who's the implementing partner? So we realize that actually not all donors have the technical capabilities to implement project directly on the ground, and so they have to contract uh, implementing partners to do so. Then you see the sector of this particular project that you have selected, and you see the aid type. Now, like the purpose of the aid map was really to try to pin down every uh, single project up to the, to the street level. Uh, for instance, here in Port Moresby, uh, we can see those two health projects from uh, DADB and the World Bank. But the thing is that you can't actually put all the projects uh, on an aid map. Like, how do you put uh, budget support, for instance? How do you put scholarship? This is actually impossible. So what we had to do is that we had to expand the ambition of our Pacific aid map to create additional uh, features to analyze the underlying data. The first of those features is a dashboard. So the dashboard allows you to compare one Pacific Island country with another or one donor with another. Now, uh, we've realized that in Australia, a lot of people are actually using the dashboard to uh, compare Australia with uh, another actually important donor in the Pacific, which is uh, China. So let's uh, do this selection right now. So here, while this is loading, you can already see that Ch Australia has actually um, Australia has uh, spent 920 million in the Pacific in 2018 on 4,000 uh, projects and activities. Comparatively, China has uh, spent 241 million on uh, 77 projects. This means that actually the projects uh, from China are much bigger in size because China does focus quite a lot on big infrastructure projects. You can also actually have a particular look on um, on uh, you know, like project from like a particular sector. So here you see that uh, Australia uh, spent 100 million on the health sector, whereas like China only spent 7 million. The more you go down, the more high level information uh, start to scroll down. So you see like um, the top five project of each donors, the top five recipient of each donor, um, how much money they've committed, but you also see like a sectoral repartition. So it means that um, you can see what is the donor specialization in here, for instance, China spends a lot into the, spent a lot in 2018 on transport projects, 40% of its aid, whereas like Australia really concentrated its, um, its aid on education and government. But if you're interested in actually looking at all the health projects, you just, ha just have to click on health and you'll see all the health projects appearing on the map, on the, on the dashboard. Another tool we have is the graphing tool. So here, it allows users to create their own trend analysis on aid. So let's say that we are interested to see how many, how much aid um, Fiji received from all development partners um, in the health sector. So this is actually a selection that you can do. So like, this is all the aid that Fiji received from 2010 to 2018. But then you can filter by uh, the sector, so health. And you'll see here that actually there was a peak in health uh, given to Fiji, health aid given to Fiji uh, in 2014. And this is mostly due to the fact that in 2012, 2013, 
there was an outbreak of leptospirosis in uh, in Fiji that actually touched uh, 1,500 people. But also in 2014, there was um, an outbreak of the dengue fever that infected more than 10,000 people. Another actually feature of this uh, dashboard of this uh, graphing tool this year is that you can actually compare the aid that uh, a particular country received to the else to the expenditure the government expenditure that a particular country did uh, for that particular sector. So here you see that despite the fact that uh, health aid was actually decreasing over time, health expenditure by the government of Fiji was actually um, was actually increasing. So those are the type of uh, analysis you can make uh, using the, the graphing tool of the aid map. Another page we have is a database page, which basically is a depository of the 37,000 projects we have in the map. You can look for a particular project by name, uh, by aid type, sector. You can also look, by, um, by look for a project by uh, implementing partner. So we have a list of 1,500 different implementing partners. Every time you click on one particular project, you have the more information that, that displays. So um, the name of the project, the description, uh, the transaction history, uh, the source of uh, where did we get the information from, but also every time we could like a website that is directly linked to the project. Uh, also, since we published the map in 2018, we realized that many people are using the map and um, mentioning the map in their own report and analysis. And so we have actually made a depository of all this analysis here uh, in this page. This is a new feature of the map uh, this year. And so you can look for a report uh, looking at a particular country or looking at a particular donor. Anyway, this is uh, one of the new gadgets we have. And the final page is the about page where we explain how we build the Pacific aid map. We explain also all the key concepts of the aid map. What is ODA? What is OOF? Um, and from it, you can also download the, the full data set of the, aid, of the aid map. You can download actually the full data set from most pages. Um, but you can also download the methodology here. So that's pretty much it for the aid map. Now, it is important to notice, to note that um, we are planning to update the map every year. We have done it. This is the first, the third time, sorry, we are updating the map and we are planning to do it uh, many, many years, many more years. But every year we're doing this, there are actually key findings. Uh, last year, for instance, our key findings led us to write a full analysis on uh, whether the debt trap narrative, the Chinese debt trap narrative was actually something happening in the Pacific. And we showed that it wasn't. At, the, at least for now, China is not engaged in debt trap diplomacy. And so this year, like the key findings are, are, are numerous. The first one is aid to the Pacific has surged in 2018 uh, by more than 25%. And it reached now like an historic high of 2.9 billion uh, US dollars, which represents approximately 8.5% of the regional GDP. So that's a quite of an increase for, for 2018. The second finding is that um, while Australia remains like the largest donor of the, of the Pacific, and in 2018 it had reached like highest, um, highest record or record high levels, um, its share of total aid is actually decreasing. So, in 2010, uh, Australian aid uh, represented 51% of the total aid given to the Pacific. In 2018, it only, represent, it only represented 32%. And this came from the fact that it's not because uh, Australia is spending less, it's actually because there are more donors being engaged in the region and all those donors are actually uh, spending more in the region. Um, so over the, full, over the full period, Australia and New Zealand still account for 52% of all the aid given to the Pacific. China remains actually one of the a steady donor with 8% of the, all the aid given to the region. And the last actually important fact is that, um, well, especially considering, considering the COVID-19 pandemic, is that uh, our aid map reveals that aid hasn't actually played a very important role in the health sector of the Pacific. So aid uh, represents 12% of all the uh, health aid, sorry, represents 12% of the total aid given to the region. And that is actually much lower than uh, the amount of aid uh, uh, allocated to governance or to infrastructure, which both of them are 22 to 23 percent. Anyway, so those are like the findings of the aid map. If you have any question, I'd be happy to answer them at the end of the event. Keep an eye on the Lowy Institute website and our digital magazine, The Interpreter, for more insights and analysis from this year's update of the Pacific Aid Map. Now, over to the dynamics of aid and COVID in the Pacific in 2020. I'm going to throw a few questions to our panelists before we jump into the Q&A. 
Our panelists have been briefed to keep their responses short and sharp, though the silver lining of the aid map uh, not working is we get a bit more time to, to have this conversation. Uh, but we want to get through as many questions from the audience as possible. But first, let me get started. Audrey, let's start with you. From your perspective as Deputy Director General of the Pacific Community, how are communities in the Pacific faring from COVID-19 and the subsequent economic fallout? How is your work at the Pacific Community pivoting and what more do you think needs to be done going forward? Well, good evening, Bulavi Naka from Suva and thank you, Jonathan, um, for the invitation uh, this evening to be with you all. Um, I, I think it's fairly, fairly evident that the, the pandemic uh, has had a crippling effect, uh, of course, on the Pacific region. Uh, an emerging reality for all of us is the toll that, is, that it is really having now on Pacific communities and their livelihoods and, of course, their wellness. Um, some countries, of course, have been more severely hit economically than others. And, and our re reality is, is that we are not only in the midst of a public health emergency, but we are still combating a, a climate emergency, not forgetting, of course, uh, in the region we've recently just had uh, a cyclone Harold. Uh, and of course, um, subsequently, we're now facing uh, an, an economic crisis. Early this year, our leaders in the region uh, chose to close their national borders uh, quite early uh, out of a broad public health um, protection strategy. This, of course, um, meant stopping all flights, transportation links, and the region uh, literally was sealed off. So for many Pacific countries who really rely on tourism, border closures and other restrictions have had a devastating impact. And we have now seen massive unemployment layoffs, closure of uh, tourism facilities, closures of small business and service industries. And of course, our, our beloved regional airlines have come to a grinding halt. Uh, and plus, and you know, and really livelihoods and the economic wellness of many of our communities have, have been now affected. In Fiji, of course, we are now seeing a third of our workforce uh, being unemployed. So countries such as uh, the Cook Islands and Fiji, Samoa, Palau, and other tourism dependent countries, where we're recognizing uh, that, you know, their GDPs anywhere between 20 and 70% really reliant on tourism and and these countries, of course, are on the, on the front line of economic hardship. Uh, and potentially some of these economies will contract up to 21%. Um, and Jonathan, you mentioned uh, in your opening remarks, Fiji is, is definitely one of those countries. And, and I no doubt Michelle will, will talk a little bit more about that. But it is, uh, I think, fair to say that many of our economies have very little room to, to counter the, yeah. the economic impact of this pandemic. Food shortages, food security remain a concern in the region. Um, we have seen agriculture and food markets being disrupted. We have seen in the region that the pandemic has affected both the availability of food and of course access to food. Uh, and, and of course this is exacerbating already the, the burden in this region of, uh, of NCDs. As well as the, the economic challenges and the livelihood impact issues, I think it's really important to note that there have been um, significant, I would call significant social and human development challenges also. You know, the loss of income for communities in particular for women and the vulnerable has meant uh, an escalation into hardship. Uh, this has been coupled, I think, with an increased challenge of safety for women and girls and families. We have seen the rise of family and domestic violence in the communities. And again, we're seeing data, for example, here in Fiji, of real unprecedented increase of the use of um, domestic violence services. The picture is probably not too dissimilar from other country experiences around the world. Uh, the difference, of course, uh, for the Pacific is that we've been a region that has been on a long, human and social development journey and, and that living in this current COVID environment has the potential for us as a region to really, I think, regress on some of our more important human and, and social development indicators, such as education and health. And uh, the example that, that I often reflect on is, is the closure of schools in this region. And we have seen close, the schools closed for quite long periods. Uh, this has been a difficult reality for many schools in the region who we really don't have the robustness of systems to open and close with flexibility, nor to ably pivot and deliver remote educational options. And I think for some countries, children have been out of school for nearly five months of this year. 
Uh, and this has been an incredibly challenging time for, for many of our Pacific education systems. As um, most of you will know, a lot of our educational systems are based around classroom learning and, and physical infrastructure. So real limited ability to, to deliver remote education uh, during these periods of, of great restriction. Um, the, the impact of schools, of course, on girls has been significant, where we are now beginning to see evidence of young girls in secondary schools not returning to school, uh, as they're now being redirected back into domestic duties. Uh, I get, and this is, for me, I think, a, a real reality. The priority, of course, in the region has been uh, ensuring that the public health systems uh, here in the region are continuing to be strengthened and, and preparation and readiness for COVID. And as of this month, seven countries in the, in the region, Solomon Islands, uh, CNMI, PNG, Fiji, French Polynesia and Guam, and of course, New Caledonia, uh, as a region, we're now reporting around 5,700 cases. We've had 75 deaths. So our, our case fatality is up around 1.3, 1.4%. Just on, on your question around how is, is SPC um, pivoting its response in, in this crisis, the focus, of course, for many regional organisations, including SPC, of course, is at the moment to support the, the strengthening of, of health systems, both preparedness and readiness uh, for the outbreak. SPC has a, a very large regional public health team, uh, and much of our efforts have been in training Pacific health professionals, uh, using PEP, clinical guidelines, preparedness and treatment, uh, and of course, more broadly, uh, health system strengthening. We, of course, been working with WHO and many other partners uh, in this space. As countries have um, started to think about their recovery and where their efforts need to be focused, we have uh, been working fairly closely with our members on identifying uh, areas that need our immediate assistance and in areas that are in our capability, of course, such as resource management, uh, agriculture, fisheries, food systems, uh, data and information, and resilience and capability development, and really working to ensure that investments in these areas don't suffer due to the, the current operating environment. We're a technical agency, and so we have been working with donors and partners to, to reprogram existing resources to areas of high need. And I think this has been really welcomed, of course, by, by countries in the region. The real challenge, of course, for agencies such, such as ours and, of course, others, is that uh, as a boots on the ground agency, uh, we've had to do a lot of rethinking about our service delivery model, uh, where we would traditionally work alongside and in countries supporting and responding to their, their development issues. The, the current environment doesn't really allow us to do that. So, of course, we've had to explore uh, different ways of working and rethinking our, our service models. And, and we're doing this by working with national counterparts, the NGOs, local consultants and, and development partners, uh, and many of them on the ground in, in these countries. We also have um, quite a lot of uh, capacity uh, in the region. Uh, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands and Ponape have sub-regional offices, uh, and SBC, of course, is located in those, in those countries. I guess one of the, the key pivots, of course, as an agency that, that convenes um, a good number of ministerial meetings in this region, we have been exploring, um, to a greater extent, digital platforms for engagement and training. Uh, we recognised, I suppose, in, in staying connected with our members that we must grow digital capacity, assets and services, uh, designing purposeful digital engagement, um, and, you know, Quite frankly, our members tell us that these are really welcomed innovations, but we're having to think very strongly about how we balance uh, virtual fatigue, um, Zoom lethargy, so to speak, uh, as many of these countries have really limited capacity to, to be uh, Zooming in constantly with, with uh, partners and agencies. We, um, we're, of course, where we can't work in the field, um, we're focusing on, on desktop-based related uh, work, you know, policy, legislation, and guidelines, and so forth. And just really to respond to your question on what needs to, to be done moving forward, um, you know, we've just come out of uh, a couple of days of uh, forum officials meetings uh, in preparation for both the leaders meeting that's coming up 
uh, and there's you know, general agreement that um, th this region does need to continue to build the resilience of, of our Blue Pacific. We really need to continue to ensure that the recovery around COVID-19 is clean, that it's green and it's resilient. Um, and to re-emphasize, of course, that climate change still remains, of course, the biggest security risk alongside the pandemic. You know, just a, a, one final comment, I think, Jonathan, is, you know, we really are in unprecedented times here in, in, in the region and our vulnerabilities are, I think, really heightened. Um, and I think we really, as a region, need to calmly navigate our way forward. Uh, we're a region that's really used to shocks and events, and we understand, of course, the importance of building resilience in every aspect of our work. I think in this regard, it's important that agencies such as ourselves and others don't really miss the opportunity to retain and to stay focused on the long-term sustainable development goals of this region, and that all our efforts and resources are not just drawn down to deal with emergencies such as this without real thoughtful consideration of the longer-term impact of short-term investments. Um, you know, my caution to donors and partners is, in, is that in, in all your investments during COVID that we don't unravel the, the long-term development efforts, that we continue to focus on those um, and not be distracted, I think, by opportunistic investments, um, maybe due to some of the geopolitical tensions that are emerging in the region. So just, just a little bit from me, Jonathan, on, on how I'm seeing uh, some of the um, issues emerging in the region currently. Thank you, Audrey. That was hardly a little. That you've covered so much ground in, in your opening remarks there and, um, you know, it painted a very stark picture for how the Pacific is, is faring, but also I think you provided us a lot of, lot of hope as well. And, you know, if, if there's one thing we do know as, as Pacific watchers and analysts and, and friends of the Pacific is that its greatest strength is its resilience. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all pull, pull through this, this crisis. And, uh, next, I'd like to jump to Michelle. Now, Michelle, the World Bank must be very busy in every part of the world helping respond to this economic and health crisis that is affecting, that is leaving no stone untouched. Uh, how is the Pacific faring compared to other parts of the world? How is the World Bank responding in the region? And what do you see will be the biggest challenges going forward for the bank? Many thanks, Jonathan. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, first of all, for the uh, invitation and very glad to be able to share some thoughts with, uh, with everyone who's, uh, who's listening in. Um, look, let me say just a, a few words about the, the work of the bank, perhaps uh, worldwide in, uh, in this crisis and then focus on the Pacific. So um, I think we're all conscious of the fact that this is a, a crisis with uh, almost no precedent. We, we must go back to the Great Depression of the 30s uh, to, to see something of, of, of this magnitude. Uh, I think the, the estimates that we have are for a contraction worldwide of more than 5% in, in 2020, and uh, a, a high probability, unfortunately, that up to 150 million people will actually fall in uh, extreme poverty um, by the year 2021, marking a, a sharp reversal to the uh, reduction of, of poverty that, that has been observed, basically, uh, year in year out for the past for the past decades, it would mean that in fact 1.4% uh, of of the world population would, would fall into extreme poverty um, uh, within the first 18 months, basically of uh, of the COVID crisis. The bank has focused its response first of all uh, worldwide on um, basically helping countries to, to deal with the health emergency. Uh, the first thing that was done was to uh, set up a fast track facility. Um, and mobilize $4 billion of, of additional uh, resources for countries around the world. And those $4 billion have now been committed. Um, 82 projects have been approved uh, by the bank, uh, serving actually 82 uh, of, of our client countries. In addition, as you can imagine, our ongoing operations worldwide have been repurposed uh, to try to address the, uh, the, the health emergency um, of, uh, of COVID-19. And so it's an additional $2.7 billion uh, which, which have been repurposed from uh, ongoing uh, operations. Now, looking at, at the future again worldwide, um, the, um, the, the, that fast track facility, which in addition to mobilizing extra money, enabled us to process uh, new projects much, much faster than, than usual in a matter of weeks, in fact. Uh, this fast track facility will be extended as far as these 
uh, emergency processes are uh, concerned. Um, and uh, basically 10 to $12 billion, which are not going to be additional, they will come from the uh, financing envelope available, already available to countries, but 10 to $12 billion will be able to be processed through that fast track facility um, in, the, in the year ahead to help countries purchase uh, vaccines when um, uh, a, a vaccine becomes available and also to strengthen their, their systems so that uh, we can help countries make sure that uh, they can not only get the vaccines, but they can actually deliver those vaccines to their population. Um, in addition to that, we are basically ramping up our lending uh, this coming year. Um, we have decided to front load uh, the financing from our IDA window, which is the, the window which we use for the, um, uh, the poorest or the smallest of, of our clients and almost all of the Pacific uh, country clients of the world then benefit from that window. And we, we are front loading our uh, financing worldwide to the tune of $35 billion. Um, and the same is true for the IBRD window, which is the window reserved for the richer uh, countries in the world, where a similar amount of money is expected to be committed uh, within this, this fiscal year. So uh, basically by June 2021. So this is, this is worldwide. Now, focusing um, on, on the Pacific, the impact on, on the Pacific, I think you, you've uh, already alluded to it. I think Audrey painted a, a, a very uh, a stark picture. Our numbers, of course, tell the same story. We see um, a, a number of countries, particularly those highly dependent on tourism, um, basically look at, at contractions in, uh, in FY20 uh, or in 2020 of between 15 and, and more than 20%. Um, we see some countries like Solomon Islands actually being quite affected by a decrease in um, um, exports of uh, logs in the case of, of Solomon Islands, which is actually going to cause a, a contraction of, of close to 15% according to our assessment. And then you have countries like uh, Samoa and uh, Tonga who also rely to a large extent on, on remittances, and, and those have also uh, dried up to, to a, a large extent. And so those countries will also be hit through that channel. Um, we are also conducting a number of socioeconomic surveys in, in the Pacific Island countries, and, and some of the early results uh, are, are quite stark indeed. I think Audrey has provided a lot of information. I'll just mention two specific points. Um, asked what measures they are taking to cope with the economic hardship that comes with the crisis, uh, people in PNG put at the top of the list of measures that they are taking, uh, basically pulling their kids out of school. 52% of respondents say that this is a strategy that they have to adopt at the moment. In, in another stark, uh, um, I suppose, uh, uh, data, if you want, or piece of, piece of data, uh, comes from Solomon Islands. 57% of people say that they've had to reduce food consumption uh, because of, of the economic crisis. And we are also seeing a, a very large um, um, emigration out of Honiara and in, in back into uh, the villages to a tune of almost 20% of the population of Honiara, which, which certainly indicates a very major economic shock. Uh, for, the, uh, for the population of, uh, of, of Honiara. And so the Bank in the Pacific is um, articulated its response first around health um, and then around uh, basically three main factors, protecting people, supporting firms, and, and building back better. Um, on the health front, um, we've uh, mobilized about $84 million so far in 10 of our 12 uh, client countries. Um, this is for emergency health operation, uh, purchasing uh, personal protective equipment, uh, strengthening uh, the provision of, of, uh, of health systems and, and services. Um, we've also um, reallocated some uh, existing funds within ongoing operations. And we've also triggered a couple of, of CAT DDO, catastrophic deferred drawdown options. So these are operations that had been um, approved in, in the recent past with money basically set aside in cases of, uh, of emergency. And of course, 
uh, COVID-19 and in some cases, uh, a tropical cyclone Harold, as Audrey uh, mentioned, were emergencies that, that justified accessing uh, those contingent funds. And so that has been done in Samoa and, and in Vanuatu, for example. Then um, we are undertaking a, a number of activities under the, the banner, as I mentioned, of protecting people, uh, supporting firms and, and building back better. One of the main concerns, um, which again, Audrey um, mentioned in, in her remarks as well, is the, the fact that the coping strategies that people have to undertake and um, the fact that the provision of public services, which is challenging at the best of time in, in the Pacific Island, is of course even more challenging in, in the time of, uh, of, of COVID-19 because of the fiscal constraints that the economic impact uh, causes. Um, these impacts can have very long lasting effects. Um, when kids miss out on their education, this is not something that uh, can be uh, corrected uh, basically immediately. Um, when, when people see their uh, uh, social capital in terms of health, for example, deteriorating, this again uh, creates very long lasting damage um, to, uh, to, to communities and, and ultimately to, to the productivity of, of a country. So one area of, of response uh, on which we are focusing are in the areas of, of education and health basically beyond the emergency health uh, response, um, trying to, to, to maintain um, a, a systems in, in working order and in, in supporting governments as they are trying basically uh, to cope with the economic impact um, without uh, shortchanging the provision of essential services. And, and similarly uh, for education with of course an, an emphasis on, uh, on, on digital platforms where possible um, which, uh, you know, whose necessity uh, is, is, uh, is more obvious than, than ever. Um, COVID-19 has also, I think, underlined the importance of um, having some social protection mechanism in place. We, we call them adaptive social protection. So systems that are basically ready to disburse money in case it is needed. And the Pacific is really sorely lagging in, in that respect. With the exception of Fiji, no country in, in the Pacific um, among the, the, the developing country clients of, of the World Bank really has a, a social protection systems covering a, a large part of, of their population. And I think there is a realization on the part of, of our clients that the time probably has come to begin to, to think about, about this and, and to take steps towards progressively building such systems. And so we are very keen to help countries think it through and, and to provide financial support where, where needed and, and we are engaged in, in, in these conversations and, and in these operations in, P, in PNG and, and in Fiji and, and we hope to be able to expand that. Um, I've mentioned protecting firms. Um, I just say one quick word on this with, with a focus on, on tourism, which is arguably the sector that is being the most hard hit um, and which also is likely to take the most time to recover. And so we've done um, some analytical work on this, looking at what it would take, basically what type of measures would need to be in place for the Pacific to be able to, to reopen. And uh, we are in conversations with, with our, our clients uh, and, and counterparts in government in, in the Pacific on, on programs to, to basically prepare the, the, the tourism sector for a, a potential uh, reopening. Uh, in, in the months and, and in the years uh, to come. And, and we hope to be able to do that, uh, not only country by country, but, but also through regional uh, programs. Um, and then finally, there is the, the building back better. Uh, a lot of this, of course, has to do with, uh, um, uh, you know, labor intensive schemes in, in infrastructure aimed at uh, building a greener, more resilient infrastructure a lot of it also has to try to help country weather the economic crisis uh, without uh, letting their macroeconomic situation deteriorate too much. So we have engagements in, in the macroeconomic sphere with um, a large number of our Pacific Island clients. This, of course, predates uh, COVID by many years. And, and this engagement remains of, of the utmost importance uh, for us. And so we are very actively uh, 
looking at what we call budget support uh, operations with all the technical assistance that accompanies those types of engagement uh, in, in a large number of, of countries. And, and those operations are there not, not only to, to try to, to fill a, a, a fiscal gap, which is of course caused by, by COVID, but also to provide support to um, enacting a number of very important reforms that would help the other pillars uh, of, of engagement with, which I've talked about. So helping measures that would put in place the first building blocks of social protection, for example, measures that government are taking to, to protecting uh, firms um, and um, measures that government would be taking to, uh, to strengthen the functioning of their health system. So all of that is part of our budget support dialogue with, uh, with, with client countries. Um, I think, uh, Jonathan, you, you, you asked me um, what might be of, of concern, basically, for us when, when we look at the future. Um, well, what, what I would say, obviously, in, in the very short term, the, the concern is about containing the, the health impact of, of COVID. The Pacific, as you've mentioned, has, I think, managed the, the health impact of COVID very, very well. Um, but, but nobody is, is, uh, is secure, really, for good at the moment. The fact that uh, Solomon Islands just had a, a first confirmed cases, um, case, I think, two days ago, uh, is, is a good reminder of, of that. So th that is something that we keep a sharp eye on. And all of these emergency health operations, which I mentioned, are, of course, geared towards that short-term priority. Then there is the, uh, the distribution of vaccine when, once it becomes available, the purchase of these vaccines for Pacific Island countries and, and the effective distribution of these vaccines, which I mentioned. The support of, of key uh, sectors, uh, tourism, of course, and then helping countries to, to manage debt. Um, it, it is clear that the stock of debt is going to increase in the Pacific Islands. Um, the region is not highly indebted, but its capacity to carry debt is very limited. Um, and this is why countries were before uh, COVID hit, um, many of them were considered at high risk of debt distress. And of course, the situation will only become worse uh, because of, of COVID. Then looking a bit more internally, uh, and this is my last word, um, we are of course concerned about our own ability uh, to, to help our clients uh, to, to, to the, you know, to the extent that we would like to be able to help them. We've substantially increased our presence in, in the Pacific. We, we now have uh, about 70 staff, and I'm not including consultants, posted in the various Pacific Islands and, and, and another 70 people in, in Sydney. This is a lot more than we had just a few years ago. Um, this presence on the ground in the Pacific Islands, of course, helps. Um, but still, um, uh, conducting business and, and helping clients implement the ongoing operation and prepare the new ones has, of course, become more challenging uh, in, in, the, in the absence of, of international travel. We are making the best possible use of all of the, all of the colleagues we have on the ground and, and of, the, of, of the digital resources at, at our disposal. Um, but, uh, but in spite of best effort, I think it is unavoidable that uh, the, the speed of implementation of, of some operation and, and the speed of preparation of, of some will, will suffer. Uh, from the, uh, the inability to have uh, the, 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 the extensive face-to-face -face engagement uh, from, uh, from, from colleagues who are not on the ground, which, which we are used to have. Let me leave it at that for now. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I'm just going to jump straight over to Charlotte, conscious of, of time. Uh, Charlotte, as the largest development partner to the region, how has Australia been shifting its aid to be more responsive to the Pacific's needs? Uh, what have you found to be the biggest challenges in pivoting in 2020 and what more can we expect from Australia in the future? Thank you. Jonathan, thanks for the question and for having me. I think I'd, I'd start by saying that um, in large part because of the step up and the efforts of the last few years to, to um, even further deeper now relationships in the Pacific. We were really well placed um, to work with the Pacific um, this year in particular through what what Michelle and um, Audrey have described has been, you know, quite a challenging um, year for all countries uh, and for people personally. Um, so well placed. I, I think there was an immediate response that was um, necessary and that was happening globally, but also affecting the work of um, that we were doing in the context of our development cooperation. So 
it, it, at the uh, early stages of the pandemic, a lot of discussions around um, uh, the implications of border restrictions, but but by and large, I think by global standards, the Pacific, Australia, New Zealand were quite early to put in place restrictions that that I think um, have clearly saved lives. So this is very important, but but we all acknowledge now has come at a huge uh, economic cost. Um, I think so. There was an immediate focus for us um, with the Pacific and with all the partners that we work with in the region on health and preparing health systems. Uh, for the for the potential impact of the pandemic, and so I think we had 130 requests for assistance between March and June that we were responding to from Pacific governments. I think we delivered something like 33 tons of uh, humanitarian um, equipment, and that was sort of testing equipment, PPE, th this kind of thing. Um, we also had experts. Um, in the field, and that included a mix of people that were already there, that are, that were part of um, existing um, development cooperation programs. So we have um, an amazing anaesthetist that works in the Port Villa Hospital, and Vanuatu government very keen um, to maintain some of these experts during during um, this period. And so we needed to put assurances in place um, uh, to make that happen. Uh, so around around uh, 100 essential advisors um, were kept in place by agreement with partners uh, um, while others were being drawn back um, into Australia in those uh, in that early phase and then we also did quite an immediate economic response and so it was around about um, April I would say where we did a full um, internal review of all of our development investments there's over 300 in consultation with Pacific governments. And we, we were looking at what we could just delay mainly. And we were looking at where we thought COVID would have an impact um, on deliverables that would produce some savings. And we, uh, we were able to find $100 million. And uh, we discussed um, uh, with the Pacific governments and of course with, with our ministers and our prime minister, the best use of that money. And it, it was then a bespoke set of packages um, but was part of our early response. And so in Fiji, um, that involved topping up, um, top, topping up the welfare system that Michelle was referring to with some additional um, cash grants that were targeted particularly at, um, at, at women-headed households and at children. Um, in PNG, there was uh, a lot of that uh, additional money was being pivoted for provincial health services. So that was an important part of our response. But then we had a lot of the individual projects that are long standing, some of them very mature in the region, like the Australia Pacific Training Coalition, like Pacific Women Shaping Pacific Development. Um, we, were, we were looking at how those programs um, adapt um, and um, ensuring that, that they were doing work that was um, absolutely, um, you know, time sensitive and critical. So I know that APTC did work with Fiji around micro skills credentials for people that were um, unemployed as a result of the impact of COVID on the tourism industry, um, uh, work of that nature. Some of our bilateral infrastructure teams with Pacific governments and other partners were doing things like um, micro hand washing stations. Um, and then of course the education teams um, who were planning to do with Pacific governments and other partners, things like curriculum reforms, they were moving to try and um, look at things like distance learning and, um, and, and um, preparing for the impacts. So this has been a really, um, uh, a really big year and there's been a lot of change, but the underpinnings of the relationships and even the underpinnings of, of, of the big programs themselves, I think actually um, were, were really uh, well designed, flexible, the relationships were strong, heaps of conversations, picking up the phone. And I think um, in, in the end, I look back and think what, what a huge year we've had um, preparing. Uh, now, of course, we need to um, we need to look uh, further forwards, um, be planning for 2021. And as Michelle said, we are still um, not beyond the pandemic. So there's still this ongoing uh, risk of outbreak in the region. And we've had medical experts in PNG helping PNG manage um, outbreaks. And we're, we're watching this case in Solomon Islands closely it would still be our government's position that we would not want to be a source of transmission into the Pacific. So we're very um, conscientious about that in decisions we're making, but at the same time, we're trying to 
um, adapt and uh, we've done things like resume um, our Pacific Labor Scheme, our Seasonal Work Scheme with, a, with an initial pilot. Um, in other areas, there's been complete pauses. So I manage um, a scholarship program that was um, targeting secondary school students who were going to come from the Pacific um, unaccompanied to, to study in Queensland and New South Wales um, from July. And we took a decision with Pacific governments um, and, and um, with, with our uh, minister to, to just temporarily pause um, the recruitment for students for that program. And then that money is going to be redirected into education in the Pacific. And we're just currently discussing um, how that's best used. So huge um, adaptation um, happening. We're doing a lot of work to reconceptualize a little bit the infrastructure financing facility. Um, it will be really um, important, we think, in part of our response to um, supporting the Pacific's economic recovery. Um, it, it can finance um, uh, infrastructure that is um, critical economically to the region uh, or socially to the region, but it can also do that in a way that um, builds resilience um, and green infrastructure. So this is really important, but also uses local labour and it can there can be upskilling attached to that. This is something Australia does really well. And I would just um, comment as well um, on uh, what Audrey was saying about the um, importance of, of maintaining some of our really long-term work. Um, something that we're really proud of is our commitment to um, building uh, resilient infrastructure. And um, we had done some work after Cyclone Winston in Fiji on reconstruction with the Fiji government. And um, for example, there was one small public health clinic uh, in a rural part of Fiji and it was hit again with Cyclone Harold. And it was one of the only buildings that was still standing second time round after Cyclone Harold, still in place so that provincial health services were able to keep going. So we were really committed to making sure that our investments in infrastructure in the, in the coming year and years ahead are gonna have deliver that kind of resilience. We all know that the Pacific um, is prone to natural disasters as, as is Australia. So this is really um, an important principle. I think the other area of engagement that we are unequivocally committed to is um, supporting women and girls, supporting a more gender equal region. And our minister has had uh, two virtual women leaders meetings and Audrey has um, been in those to discuss the impact of COVID on women and girls. It, it is disproportionate and it is a threat to gains that have already been made. And so we're committed to continuing work, if not expanding work and talking to regional partners in particular and national governments to civil society. And then the, the other area of work that I just wanted to touch on, which is not development cooperation, but it's related to um, work we're doing to build deeper connections or facilitate deeper connections between, um, between uh, 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 different um, parts of our community. And so in sport and between churches, um, we're, we're continuing to advance that work. And we were able, in, in honour of Fiji Day, which is today, but we were a bit ahead on Saturday, we were able, for example, to um, stage a really nice uh, exhibition match in Sydney, actually, between uh, the Wallabies and the Wallaroos and the Fiji legends. And then we streamed that into Fiji as um, our effort to still celebrate that really important occasion, even though, as Michelle said, it's difficult to do some of this work without that connectivity. I think flights um, at the moment are 1% of what they were at this time last year. So uh, there, there's some of my reflections, Jono, and I know you're short on time, so I'll just pause there. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say, um, but in reference to the second half of your question about what more you might expect from us, I think we, it was budget week here in Canberra and there was a couple of announcements and one was um, a commitment of 1.44 billion in ODA to the Pacific from Australia this financial year. So we obviously work on, on a July to June financial year, unlike the Pacific, which is mostly calendar. But that's, that's um, of course, an important ongoing contribution. And then in addition to that, the government announced that it would establish a 300 million temporary two year uh, COVID response fund. So that's supplementary. Um, and this is going to be important. Um, this is another capability. Um, it's going to allow us to be responsive again in 2021 and for the rest of this year to 
um, the needs of the Pacific in terms of um, both, both additional fiscal support that the countries may need, but also this really important support for um, vulnerable people who are disproportionately affected by the crisis. And in those areas that we're hearing about where we're concerned that we could see losses in gains to date or long-term implications from, um, from health impacts or from um, from this extended um, period for some kids of being out of school. Uh, so so uh, all of those areas will be a focus um, of ours in the months ahead. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks for that. Uh, given time, we, we might give ourselves a few minutes leniency at the six o'clock mark, but I will do a bit of a speed round of questions and I will challenge all of our panellists to keep their, remark their responses to under two minutes. Uh, each, but uh, let's let's get started. So, the first question I have here is for from Darren Ward from the Direct Impact Group. He asks: Will COVID and the related travel issues increase momentum for localization, or will the economic crisis increase aid dependency? I might ask Audrey to have a crack at that one. The second question I have is from Jean-Paul Penrose uh, from DFID, the UK aid program in Suva. He asks: Given unprecedented levels of finance to tackle COVID-19. How resilient are these investments and will they guard against future shocks? And finally, and I might ask uh, Michelle to have a, have a crack at that one. And finally, we have a question from Fantasha Lockingham from the Fiji Hotel and Tourism Association. She asks, how can we assist uh, Pacific Island country skilled and semi-skilled unemployed workers access jobs through the Pacific Labor Scheme or Seasonal Workers Program? Now, we've had quite a few questions on that one uh, from the registrations. So I might, I'm, I'll pass that one to Charlotte. So uh, first over to you, Audrey, and just a reminder to panelists to unmute themselves uh, at the start of the, the response. Um, thanks, Jonathan. And I, I did see that question pop up and uh, I, I just caught the last bit of it actually, which is around aid dependency in the region. Um, and we all know actually that the Pacific is, is um, one of the and probably is still the uh, the uh, highest uh, dependent region on aid uh, per head of population. Um, you know, I made some comments in my in my opening remarks around the need to be really cautious around the way we keep investing uh, in the region, particularly given uh, the demands that COVID are, are having on on many of the countries. And and my caution is still remains around that we think very carefully about. The, um, the sustainability of, of those investments. I have no doubt that COVID is actually going to create um, a deeper and longer dependency on aid. I have, I have no doubt about that. You know, the, the traditional way of investments in, in the region comes in a number of different ways, both through projects and programming. Um, you know, we have huge resources flowing through regional organisations, civil society, NGOs, and so forth. Um, and, and during COVID, of course, we're now seeing quite substantial cash donations uh, flowing in and out of the region. Um, we've, we've, of course, got uh, significant contributions around medical supplies, equipment, testing equipment, and so forth. And, um, you know, the, the region as a whole has, has, has at times wanted to retreat a little bit back from, from budget support. But uh, at the Foreign Economic Ministers meeting a couple of months ago, there was a real call by Pacific Ministers, actually, to partners to consider increasing budget support. And so I think bilateral investments now by partners, um, as Michelle has said, through the banks, uh, we, they are now contributing uh, much more directly bilaterally support uh, and enabling, of course, countries to, um, to counter some of the economic fall, uh, fallout. So yes, I do think uh, COVID, unfortunately, is, is going to create uh, a more conducive environment for aid dependency for the region. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. I might go, now go to Michelle for that for that second question on the resilience of this new finance we're seeing from COVID-19. Many thanks, Jonathan. Um, yeah, no, very good question. Look, in, in terms of um, additional volumes of, uh, of, of financing, just talking about the, the World Bank and, and to put things in perspective, um, basically three years ago, um, we were um, committing about 300 million US dollars over three years uh, in, um, in, in the Pacific. A, a, a bit more than that, I should say, but the, the, the allocation that the, the countries could draw on directly uh, from the bank was, was in the order of 300 to 400 million dollars. 
we are hoping to be able to commit that in one year, uh, basically, uh, over the, the current fiscal year, which ends in, in, in June 2021. So, indeed, uh, substantially higher volumes of financing than, uh, than before. Um, will it lead to resilient investments? Um, I, I believe so. Um, and um, I think we, we should understand resilience in its multiple dimensions here. So, one is, of course, um, are things that are going to be built with that money uh, going to be resilient, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking climate resilient especially. And I think that it is fair to say that that really has become a driving factor of all of the uh, operations uh, and, and projects that we do with climate governments in, in, in infrastructure. Um, I, I think uh, Charlotte mentioned a very nice example of a, of, of a clinic that, that had actually uh, uh, sustained uh, uh, successfully tropical cyclone. Harold, we have uh, similar stories for a school reconstruction program in, in Vanuatu, um, which, which also actually uh, uh, sustained the tropical cyclone Harold and in fact served as shelter for, for the population uh, uh, very, uh, very successfully. So these, these are examples we are very proud of and, and that we, we intend uh, to, to continue streamlining into all of our infrastructure operations. I think another dimension of, of resilience is, is also investing in people. Um, so, investing in education, investing in health, um, investing in social protection, and, and making people more resilient in, 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 in many dimensions, better able to cope with, with the health crisis, better able to cope with, with economic crisis, better able to adapt to, to a changing world. And so, as, as I mentioned, um, I think an increasing part of, of the financing that is made available to Pacific Island countries is oriented towards those types of investments. And then finally, there is the macroeconomic uh, resiliency, uh, which is at the core of, of the macroeconomic engagement that we have with countries, which I mentioned, at the core of the budget support operations that we are working on together with, with our client partners. And so that, that will certainly uh, continue to be a prime area of, of emphasis of, of our work in the Pacific. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I'll jump over to Charlotte now. And an, an additional question to you, Charlotte, we've had so many questions on asking, when are we going to get a travel bubble with the Pacific? Can you give us any indication? Well, on the first um, question, we have recommenced the labour schemes after a, a temporary pause. Um, but it is important, there's a couple of things um, to talk through. So one is that um, it's important that employers in Australia, before they employ um, labour through these schemes, they need to test the local labour market to ensure that um, Australians are given priorities for those vacancies and um, Pacific people un understand that there's increased unemployment in Australia at the moment as well. Um, but but we we find and why the schemes exist is that there there is unmet demand and so then then the schemes exist to connect those people looking for work in the Pacific with employers in Australia looking for um, workers and the Pacific um, continues to be a really attractive um, source of um, workers to to Australian um, industry so this is the, this is really important scheme. Um, and so what we've done, but it's, it's a slower process than I know people would like, is we're working with um, state government, with industry, then with the Pacific governments, um, and then with individuals on the resumption of recruitment for those programs. But we're, we've started with a particular pilot in the Northern Territory with the mango industry and then with a group of Vanuatu workers. And, and we, there's, there's, um, it's time consuming at the moment as well because we need um, to go through um, different forms of pre-departure training. Um, there are different levels of health approvals and travel approvals necessary. There, there aren't the connectivity of flights. So it's going to take a little bit of time, um, but, but this is a big priority. On the second question around um, when we'll see travel bubbles in place, this is also a priority, but I would go back to something I said earlier, which is it, it's still really important at this time when we don't have a vaccine yet, um, that we are, not, we are not a source of transmission, we're not a vector. Um, and so, so um, we need to work carefully and then the Pacific governments need to consider their own position really carefully around um, uh, border restrictions and, and, and um, travel rules. So we can't move, I think, faster than is safe. That's really important. 
Um, but we are working at the moment um, with New Zealand in the first instance on, on uh, travel between Australia and New Zealand. We're having an engagement with Fiji and other countries and it is a priority for us um, to get to a place and we think it, it, it is um, feasible where we do have that connectivity with our immediate neighbours. Um, but, but unfortunately, Jonathan, it's going to take as long as it takes to, to get this uh, right. But I can just say it's a really high priority for us. Before we go, a quick plug for the next Lowy Institute Live event on Thursday, the 15th of October, where our director, Michael Fullilove, will sit down with former US Secretary of Defence, James Mattis, and former Australian Chief of Defence Forces, Sir Angus Houston. You can register now on our website. Thank you all for participating. Stay safe and good night.